Carolyn Barnes. I'm an assistant professor here at the Sanford School of Public Policy, and I am a faculty affiliate in the Center for Child and Family Policy. I am so glad to have you here for our session on rooting the work of early childhood policy and equity. As scholarship and data illustrate, structural and systemic racism are pervasive in current US economic and social policy and have contributed to and perpetuate vast inequities in outcomes for children and families of color. During this session, I am honored to be joined by Dr. Yoma Eureka, Eureka and Dr. Aisha Ray. I will moderate a discussion between our distinguished guests about the critical need for national, state, and local early childhood policies that attend to the needs of children and families of color. So I am pleased to introduce Dr. Yoma Erika. Uh, Dr. Erika is a research professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as a senior fellow at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute and the founding director of the Equity Research Action Coalition. She leads projects and initiatives focused on ensuring that minoritized children and children from low-income households, especially Black children, are thriving. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Aisha Ray. Dr. Ray is a distinguished fellow at the BUILD Initiative and Professor Emerita of Child Development at the Erickson Institute. At the BUILD Initiative, she co-leads the Equity Leaders Action Network, a national racial equity leadership program. Dr. Ray is a nationally recognized expert on issues of early childhood workforce policies and practices that continue to reinforce and reproduce racial marginalization and exclusion and the preparation of early childhood leaders committed to racial equity and justice. Dr. Erika and Dr. Ray, we are thrilled that you're able to join us today. So I'm gonna start um, with a couple of questions. Uh, so, we know uh, that structural inequality is real. We know that structural racism uh, is real. And we know uh, we've got all these um, uh, studies and we've got a lot of work that demonstrates racial inequality. From a policy perspective, um, as local community states and federal government consider universal policies and reorganize systems for families with young children, what do we need to know about the lack of equity in current targeted programs. So we've documented all this racial inequality. What do we need to know about policy and how it's perpetuating these inequalities? So I'm happy to go first and, and then, you know, pass it on to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ray. I mean, so I feel like first and foremost, we could all agree that, you, like you just said, Dr. Barnes, right? That we know about structural inequality, specifically structural racism. And to me, as we think about sort of universal policies, whether at the local, state, or federal government area, we need to really think about equity. And so when I use the word equity, right, because equity is kind of the flavor of the day or the year, whatever you say, right? And so when I think about equity, I kind of think of Cameron P. Jones' definition that equity is about both a fair and just opportunity, but also addressing historical injustices. Like you can't just go and say, let me create a universal system whether around WIC or Head Start or Medicaid, if you don't actually say, you know what, let's make sure we understand, uh, is this universal program or system also prepared to address historical injustices? So take early childhood, right? We know that early childhood is matters, you know, the evidence we have from both the Carolina Abbasidarian study, from the high school prayer preschool study, we understand the value of those seminal studies. And I should point out, most of the kids and families were black. Right. So if we understand those those uh, sort of studies. We also know that even today, many black children are less likely to access the high quality version of early child programs. So we need to really think about universality, but also the issue of equity that must be centered in universality in many, many ways. Right. So, for example, um, when I think about how do we begin to like when I think somebody talked earlier in your panel uh, about sort of unemployment insurance, that even though it was supposed to be accessible, particularly for those who needed it, there was still data that says black people were less likely to get unemployment insurance. Even in your work, Dr. Barnes, that you presented, we also showed that even for the, even when, when um, flexibility was provided, a lot of families who needed it and deserved it were, were not able to get the flexibility either through able to purchase from Amazon or Walmart. They didn't even know 
that they have these options. So to me, I think we have to really not just see universality as like the fix all. We need to also see that because we are in a country where we have structured racism and structured inequities, equity cannot be a speed bump. It is a process and it is an outcome. And to me, it's really about a focus on justice, right? If, don't just build universality because we want people to get stuff. We need to build universality with the idea of how do we make sure that those who could benefit the most from it, those who actually deserve it, because they probably have been working uh, many, many, in, in many, many ways. Like my mother was, you know, worked three jobs and we were still living in a project. So, so it's not about the issue of, of, of sort of like a handout, is that universality should get to equality, should get to giving the most for those who already do a lot and just get a little out of it. So I agree with you, Ioma. Um, I would add that um, what we need to know about the lack of equity in current targeted programs is that we cannot fully remove those built-in inequities without addressing the uh, our difficulty as a nation in actually seeing children, but especially Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian American, and Pacific Islander children as deserving of universal programs and policies designed to help them succeed and thrive. I mean, we have the, the, the amount of sort of negative imaging, narr negative narratives, for example, about Black families, Black children, Black youth, Black communities, is profound in the society. And in order to build the kind of will that you have to have to build universal programs, you have to interrogate and break down those realities. Uh, so the building of universal access to all, which is needed by the most marginalized, racially and ethnically and social class marginalized communities, that's a, a, a wonderful goal but very difficult to do. We know that there is social science research, for example, that shows that the more white Americans view a program as targeted to serve people of color, the less likely they are to support it. There's a f fairly strong body of research about this. And so while we may like to talk about in our field, universal services, we have never actually developed universal services for most children of color. Head Start, while we think of it as something that's universal, actually there are lots of kids who don't use it, aren't included. The same is true of childcare, the same is true of healthcare, and so on and so forth. So one problem, problematic part of the question here is, this, is what we mean by universal. Are we really seeking to develop programs that serve all children, which tends to make Americans, including white Americans, more likely to support them if they believe their children will benefit too? Or are we supporting targeted programs? And a further issue about this is that I, the, the most pressing problem for Black and Indigenous children in the United States, for Latinx children, really is the second pathway of development that we've, we've created. The, develop, the pathway that has little opportunity, uh, lots of bumps and, and barriers, uh, isolates children in communities of low wealth in which there's deep disinvestment that's historic for African-Americans if you think about enslavement, historic for indigenous children if you think about the, uh, the extraction of their land and treasure from, their, from tribal communities over hundreds of years. Those kinds of communities, those groups of people may need far greater responses that focus on what, what uh, Dr. Darity at, at Duke has talked about as reparations to remedy the inequality. Other kinds of inequality that may be, a stat, may be more recent that may have developed since the Roosevelt administration forward may be things that need to be addressed in a somewhat different way. But these deeply disinvested in communities that are barrios, reservations, ghettos, the negative language that we've used to describe them, those communities may need special attention from early childhood policy leaders. And really not just in terms of, do we need more WIC and do we need more SNAP? We do, but we may need really deeper income 
equality investments and prosperity investments in those communities in order to lift children and families up. Can I add one more thing, especially in hearing Dr. Ray? Could you hear me okay better now? Without that sound, it was in my ear. Um, and, and so I feel like part of what I'm also hearing from Dr. Ray, and I think this is what we also know in, in a lot of our data, is that that even when you do provide access, so even say you provide access to Head Start or some sort of community-based programs, or even let's take pre-K, for example, which is, is a, a big thing here in North Carolina, but also in other parts of the country, we still see that certain groups of kids are likely to be in the lowest quality care of those programs, right? We see the same thing with health insurance. You're going to get, you know, you're able to get maybe there's more access to health insurance, particularly for, for uh, families who are of color, uh, families who are low income. But then the quality of care is still a problem. This We still have an issue around informed mortality, maternal mortality. So so I think the issue is, is, is an access issue could be one, but also is the quality of the access of what you get. And I think to, to Dr. Ray, you know, really brilliant point about we we don't know what universality really is, especially when you take an equity lens to it, because we're assuming that, you know what, because people talk equity, but they really mean equality, right? They mean universals pretty much give everybody the same thing and then hope that, you know, the disparities disappear. But that's not what it is, that we have to really be intentional how we do it. But even when we have universal kind of programs, say even in New York City's universal program or even in Boston's pre-K program, even within those microcosm of universality, we still see a level of segregation of programs. So in the end mm -hmm. of it, even our local uh, data indicates that we find a way to segregate children, particularly Black children, our Latina children, to be in, in, in sort of lower quality programs is not just about lower quality, they're also harmful. So to me, it's almost like you take a group of people who are literally dealing with both intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, contemporary trauma, and then you say, you know what, I'm going to create this great program, allegedly, and then we put them in there and we're like, oh, why didn't you get smarter? Why didn't you, you know, stop being, mis why, why don't you stop misbehaving? And we put all of this blame on young people who were just trying to be, to be joyful, to be happy, to learn and engage and be curious, but we continue to put them in these universal settings that are not really uh, affirming them and are not really being uh, healing them and are not really uplifting the best of who they are. Well, the, the other problem I think is that, <clears throat> pardon me, our interventions are not targeted at families and communities. That is, how do you, we, we tend to in early childhood focus on children for obvious reasons, but with some of our best interventions like Head Start, we have really focused on how do you lift up families. For, so for all of the initial um, programs that were created, Abecedarian, uh, uh, Ypsilanti's program, Ch Chicago's Child and Parent Centers, all of them focused on how do you wrap around services around families because the assumption was Children just don't grow up without people around them. And those people have to have the redu stress reduced and they have to have the means to be able to support their children. I think our initiatives really need to uh, always hold us accountable for how are we actually helping our most disadvantaged families and our most marginalized communities to actually build the capacities that we have extracted through policies that systematically have taken wealth out of those communities through fees and, fees and fines, through taxes, through extraction processes that involve credit companies that are allowed to sell credit to people and get them into deep debt when they can't get credit any other way. These extraction processes, including urban renewal, which is basically black or brown renewal, or removal, how those things have devastated families and children's in the environment we want children to be raised in. We need to look at that in a much deeper way. We need to be accountable for it. We need to take it really seriously. Otherwise, we're not going to do equity work, in my view. And to both of your points, uh, I think there's an underlying assumption in this space that 
um, policies that are targeting families and kids. So that might include um, early childhood education policies. It might include um, nutrition assistance. It might include health care. They weren't really designed for families of color to thrive. If we think about the historical origins of the welfare state and its many manifestations and iterations, um, you know, you look at the New Deal, Black people were excluded <laughs> from the benefits mm -hmm. of, you know, the first sort of federal step towards a social welfare state in the U.S. And if we look at um, the second sort of major iteration of um, the social safety net being the Great Society and the War on Poverty, you know, Black families are pathologized. Um, the roots of those, of many of those policies um, that, you know, we're kind of seeing now the contemporary manifestations of pathologized families of color. So in a, in a, in a real way, what I'm hearing from both of you is that, you know, these policies weren't really ever designed for, for families of color to thrive. And we need to really think about a wholesale reimagining. I like that, um, that word, reimagining of what, uh, what programs should look like. Should there be some compensatory or reparation-like targeted em em emphasis for communities of color that have been um, divested and neglected? Should there be um, uh, efforts to ensure that there isn't this racial stratification or racial isolation and segregation within these quote unquote universal programs. So I'm gonna shift gears and, and since we've identified what we don't know or what we need to know in this space, I'm gonna shift gears and really kind of um, challenge you to, to uh, help us think through what we could do now, right? So if, we, if you could imagine or reimagine what this space looks like, what would you do? I'll start first <laughs> while I give you give you a chance to think. I I think that we need to um, rethink how federalism shows up in a lot of these big federal programs. So I'm talking Medicaid, I'm talking SNAP, I'm talking um, WIC. Those are the three programs that I'm interested in, the child care subsidy as well. Um, we